my name is Matthew Johnson, and I work for Microsoft Mixed Reality in our research lab here in Cambridge, where we prototype and develop artificial intelligence technologies geared around human understanding. A key secret to our success has been our work at the bleeding edge between computer graphics and computer vision, and it is this work that I'm excited to share with you today. Understanding humans is at the heart of our research. The better we can understand people and their personalities as expressed through motion and expression, the more empowered each person will be to express themselves through their avatars. In a future world mediated through augmented reality, accurate and fair systems for understanding humans will be the linchpin of communications technology. Here you see results trained using the techniques I will discuss today, showing the deep and accurate understanding we are able to achieve of human face movement without the use of markers of any kind. These systems are empowered through the application of cutting edge artificial intelligence techniques to large quantities of data gathered and labeled at relatively low cost. That last part, the data, is the secret behind what you see here. The surprising outcome was that instead of using traditional, by which I mean costly, techniques to gather and label this data, we were able to fake it, but still make it. However, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Before we dive into the specifics of our research, it may help to get everyone thinking about artificial intelligence in the same way. Whatever the problem may be that you're trying to solve, the approach is largely the same. The system you want to build will take data as input, for example, images, sensor data, sound waves, text, and then accomplish some task with that data. Typically, that task is something you would otherwise need a human to do, for example, detecting and recognizing faces, or summarizing a document, or recognizing what song is playing. In order to achieve this task, the AI needs to be shown what to do in some way, usually by associating input data with desired output data. Furthermore, the input data tends to be noisy and too ill-formatted for the AI to learn from, and thus needs to be processed in some way before it begins understood uh, by the AI algorithm. If processing input data and assigning desired outputs sounds like a lot of work, it's because it is. Data acquisition is the most important and often most expensive part of machine learning, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Indeed, this acquisition cost axis is a great way to plan how to tackle a problem. This quadrant here shows the cost of data acquisition increasing on the horizontal axis and the cost of label acquisition increasing on the vertical axis. As we look at the top half of the quadrant, we have domains in which only a smaller, often specially trained portion of the population is capable of providing labels. Uh, medical or scientific data sets fall into this category and also things like landmarks on the face. Arguably, there are things which are not even in this chart, by which I mean like entities that are impossible to label in real data, for example, uh, an accurate surface normal on objects or occluded body parts. In the right half of the quadrant, data is expensive to come by and thus typically exists in lower quantities. This could be due to legal restrictions like GDPR, uh, the cost of the hardware involved like capture rigs or particle accelerators, um, or the complexity of the problem domain in which gathering data requires being able to unlock parts of the observation space through intelligent action, as is often the case in virtual environments like games. Generally, on the left side of this quadrant, data is cheap and easy to gather and thus abundant, which is a prerequisite for machine learning systems that generalize to a wide variety of use cases. So most of the recent successes in machine learning and artificial intelligence in recent years have come in problem domains which sit solidly in the bottom left of this quadrant. Image understanding and sound recognition share the same distinction that there are now exist large corpora of labeled input and output data for use in a wide variety of machine learning tasks. Furthermore, Building more data sets of this kind is fairly cost effective, as humans with little to no training can, for example, recognize which images have cats in them or transcribe spoken text in their own language. The closer your problem is to that bottom left quadrant, the more likely it is that AI will be a useful tool. The reason the bottom left of the data quadrant is such a good place to be is due to the unreasonable success in recent years of supervised learning, often in the form of multi-level perceptrons or, as they are more commonly known, deep neural nets. A neural net takes raw data, for example an image, represents it as a multidimensional tensor, and then learns a mapping from that input to a specific target via a process known as backpropagation. As the network trains, it learns to separate the different classes based upon their labels. As you can see here, the network learns three different classifiers, one per color, and keeps improving them as needed in order to increase accuracy and decrease some energy, often called a loss function. While this can seem like magic, what is happening behind the scenes is that the network first learns a mapping of the data from its input space, where it is not separable by a line, to an intermediate space in which it can be separated by a line. It then fits that line in order to perform the classification. 
In this animation, you'll see the input space on the left, colored by the network predictions during training. And on the right, you see the projected space and classifying line the network is learning. This same principle applies to more complex data than simply 2D points. Here we have a network learning to tell the difference between threes and fives. Each of these images is represented as a 784 dimensional vector of ones and zeros, but the network ultimately takes this complex data and projects it so that it can be separated. This technique is so powerful that it drives an increasing number of the practical AI systems we see deployed from apps on our phone to military surveillance systems and everything in between. So, as researchers, we were looking at our problem domain of human understanding and recognized we ultimately had a data problem. We had some face data, which we gathered at some expense, and a few motion capture data sets that were similarly difficult and expensive to gather. While this data was and remains invaluable, we didn't have enough to be able to take advantage of powerful supervised methods. What could we do to move our problem into this golden data quadrant? This is where faking it comes into play. Instead of gathering the data using actual humans, which is expensive at the best of times and became practically impossible as a result of the pandemic, we used our face synthetic system to create fake humans. You can see some of them in this video. A countless number of fake humans could be generated, sampled such that they covered as much as possible the full range of appearance variation in humans, skin tones, hair colors, glasses, facial tattoos, headwear, you name it. But that wasn't even the best part. The best part was that we knew the location of every hair on their head in perfect detail, allowing the automatic creation of pixel-perfect labeling data better than any human laborer could ever produce. In some cases, we were able to produce targets such as dense face landmarks, which would be impossible for a human to produce consistently. However, the question remained whether this mountain of training data we were able to create could be used to create systems that worked on real images of humans in the wild. We had some reason to be hopeful that it would, though. You may be surprised to find out that HoloLens 2 hand tracking was trained using synthetic data, training images made using computer graphics. And we had an awesome synthetic pipeline for this, but the problem was our synthetic hand model ended at the forearm. While our hand model looked very realistic close up, we couldn't make realistic full frame images, which is why we still had to use a lot of real data for training the hand detector network. So, we asked ourselves, what do we need to do to get to a place where we can have 100% synthetic training data? Good synthetic data must achieve three sometimes competing goals, realism, diversity, and label richness. First, let's talk about realism. In many ways, this is the most important thing to get right. On the left, you can see examples of synthetic training data, which are, to be generous, less than realistic. In these circumstances, a human body or hand have been superimposed on random background images. While it will certainly help the network to be robust to some forms of disruption, there's been no effort through lighting or composition to incorporate the object into the scene. As we move to the right, uh, we see a marked increase in realism. We always want to be on the right side of this line. Other people have found success with less realistic data, and that's great. But we always worry about the potential domain mismatch going from synthetic data to real data. For training data to generalize to real world in the wild scenarios, it should also represent the diversity of humanity. A key advantage of synthetic data is that it frees us from the usual limitations of data gathering with humans, which largely come from challenges with recruitment. Let's face it, there is a reason why out-of-work actors are overrepresented in facial and body capture data sets. Humans can look very different from one another, both in their size and shape and in the clothes and accessories they choose to wear. On one end of the spectrum, you can make synthetic data that handles the most common cases very well, for example, uh, t-shirts and jeans. From a graphics perspective, these clothes are some of the easiest to author and animate, but human diversity has a very long tail. If you want your AI system to empower all people on Earth in their endless diversity, you might need to make serious investment in clothing diversity, for example. But it is more than that. The goal is that every aspect of human diversity be considered and modeled. Finally, let's talk about labels. There are many different human-related problems in computer vision, and they can require different types of label. Sometimes, quite coarse labels are sufficient, uh, for example, bounding boxes. But sometimes, you want much richer labels, for example, physically accurate skeletal joints or dense surface correspondences. 
These are the kind of labels that are very hard, if not impossible, for a human to annotate. Yet it's these kinds of problems that synthetics can unlock. You see, with synthetics, when you do a render, you get this kind of label for free. So how do we make good synthetic data? Well, the first thing to realize is that synthetics is visual effects. Often in the literature, synthetics is used as a toy problem. That's one end of the synthetic spectrum. On the other end, it can be fully fledged visual effects. Our goal is to render a lot of realistic images, just like in a film, except we're rendering much more data, days worth of data. Also, we must remember that diversity is super important. For a film in the cinema, maybe there will be a few hundred different shots. But for maximum diversity in our training data, each frame should be as different as possible from every other frame. So unless you have a massive production house of artists that can prepare hundreds of thousands of different shots, you're going to want to do this procedurally. So how do we tackle this problem? Well, this is our approach to human-centric data. It's certainly not the only approach, but we found that it worked well. It all starts with a really good parametric 3D model of a human or a part of a human. Luckily for us in human understanding, in general, it's possible to parameterize human beings and map from one human to another human. So this is generally a typical 3D mesh, probably with bones, maybe with blend shapes. And given parameters to this model, you can create any sort of human, well, naked human, that is obviously, clothes will come later. Um, now, it's not enough to be able to generate static humans, and the wild humans look very different because they move around. So you also need a comprehensive and diverse pose database that covers your target scenarios. Um, and then once you've posed your humans, you need to put clothing on. So another key part of this diversity is what we wear. Uh, given the infinite variety in human apparel, this is an area of constant improvement for us as we acquire or generate new assets. But it's important to have breadth instead of depth, better 10 style of glasses than 10 examples of a single style, for example. I mean, obviously it's best to have 100 style example combinations, uh, but it's better to start with breadth. And then once you've got all that, you need a good renderer that can be procedurally controlled uh, to bring it all together. We generate human faces in upper torsos via an entirely automatic procedure. We first sample identity and expression, then we apply texture, sample a hairstyle, add the clothed torso, and then finally environmental effects and lighting. I'll begin by discussing our proprietary parametric face model. Each face begins as an identity and expression neutral template face. We then sample an identity from a generative model, which is applied to the template as a set of vertex differences. We then sample an expression from a separate expression model, which is applied to the identity mesh. We then pose the head and eyes using linear blend scanning. We use a parametric face model to capture how face shape varies across the human population and changes with expression. Here you can see some samples from the identity model with no expression applied. The identity model is linear and learned from a diverse set of 500 retopologized 3D scans. Our expression basis, on the other hand, consists of a handcrafted set of expression blend shapes created by an artist. Our identity scans were commissioned or purchased from Infinite Realities and 1024. Upon receiving the raw scan and texture, we manually cleaned them to remove noisy geometry and hair. These clean scans were then retopologized to our parametric face model's geometry and used to create both the generative identity model and to build a library of skin textures. Here are some samples from our scan library after the cleaning process, hopefully giving you some sense of the diversity and appearance we are aiming to model. Our aim is to gather as diverse a set of scans as possible to train our identity models. This is where we run right up against the recruitment problem I mentioned earlier. The locations where the companies who perform these captures operate juxtaposed with the ways in which people are recruited for these scans has resulted in an incredibly skewed data set. Our participants are typically young and white, out-of-work actors. This isn't just us, by the way. This problem is industry-wide. While our data contains equal measures of male and female presenting subjects, the clear underrepresentation of people of color and the elderly is a major concern, which we are addressing through targeted recruitment work. Ultimately, as we continue our data capture efforts so as to improve the quality of our models, we aim to flatten these curves to increase our representation of all ages and skin tones. So once we've sampled identity, we now apply an expression to the model, which is a combination of artist design linear blend shapes and posing of the eyes and head. While the expression geometry itself is formed from linear blend shapes, 
these blend shapes don't say anything about the probability of different combinations of expression or their dynamics. For this, we created a library of poses drawn from capture sequences. We captured 104 subjects in our multi-camera rig and then fit our parametric face model to the sequences, resulting in 69,320 frames of expression data, including head pose, facial expressions, and eye gaze. Creating the library required us to do some bootstrapping. We began with a neural network trained to detect dense landmarks along the surface of the face, using data where the expression was sampled from a simple set of plausible expressions. Using this network, we extracted dense landmarks from each frame and then fit our parametric model to it. This then gave us expression data, which we could use to create a new data set with a richer variety of expressions, which in turn could be used to train a better dense landmark detector. A few iterations of this cycle resulted in a diverse library of plausible human expressions. As a quick aside, synthetic frameworks can act as data multipliers. For example, we collect a new expression sequence, and then we can replay it on all of our synthetic heads. We end up with a Cartesian product of possible combinations and increased diversity with every hairstyle, motion sequence, etc. Um, that we add to our library. So, getting back to our pipeline, uh, once the model has been given an identity and an expression, we then can apply a skin tone texture. Instead of generating the textures dynamically, we sample from the high-resolution skin textures that we gathered uh, from our identity scans. We model the skin material as a combination of albedo, coarse displacement, mesodisplacement, and skin tone-appropriate subsurface scattering. So, now that the model has skin, we add in hair. Our growing library of hair grooms have been created by an expert 3D hair artist. Our model is strand-based and is split into eyebrows, facial hair, head hair, and eyelashes. These can be combined using hair of different colors and levels of grayness, including models for dyed hair as well. Diversity of hairstyles is incredibly important. Naturally, there are some tasks which we want to achieve which require the accurate segmentation and tracking of hair, but hair also acts as an occluding element. Facial hair covering the mouth or long hair occluding the eyes or ears can make various tasks considerably harder. By including a diverse set of hairstyles, we help the AI to learn how to compensate for these difficulties. Once the hairstyle has been applied, we can then add in clothing. As a general rule, it's important for the model to work for people who aren't naked. So there's many methods out there now for making a body model look clothed, and they generally rely on having some sort of clothing geometry on top of the body model. We went with the VFX approach, using Marvelous Designer to prepare clothes. We are able to generate a wide variety of clothing styles and colors on the upper torso. This is important, as AI models like to cheat. If, for example, all of your subjects were wearing crew neck t-shirts, an AI model could learn to use the line of the collar to predict things like head pose. Take that away, and you would see a degradation in performance. Thus, as is always the case, we want to have a wide variety of clothing so that the network learns to solve things the hard way that generalizes to the widest variety of people. Before, we talked about the importance to go breadth first. However, we can also go to some depth by using procedural materials to allow us to create a lot more diversity cheaply. For example, we can randomly sample the checked or line patterns on clothing by controlling width, color, and angle of those patterns. We don't just clothe the torso, however. As with hair, headwear and glasses can occlude or otherwise complicate many face-related AI tasks. Thus, we ensure the AI encounters a wide variety of these as well. Here you can see a video showing uh, the same identity being clothed in a variety of different headwear, glasses, uh, clothing on the upper torso, just to give you an idea of just how much even the same individual can completely change in their appearance based upon the kinds of clothing that they're wearing and the sorts of things they have on their head. Now that the model has an identity, expression, skin, hair, and clothes, as a final step, we place it in a realistic environment. We use high dynamic range images, or HDRIs, to illuminate the face and provide a background. The same face can look very different, as you can see, under different illumination. 
We use Blender's built-in path tracer cycles because, well, basically, it's been good enough. A huge benefit for us here has been how easy it is to instrument Blender via scripting for large-scale, reproducible procedural rendering, which we perform in Azure. The label data is produced via custom shaders, and I mean, almost anything can be produced, but uh, the most useful types so far have been semantic segmentations of the face, normal maps, and landmarks. If this all seems wonderfully useful, it is. However, one cannot simply sample at random and render everything. While each image will be correct, that is, it will contain a human head and accurate ground truth, some of these images may be impossible to work with due to extreme lighting effects or angles. Thus, uh, we want to strike a balance between ground truth, which is easy, by which I mean kind of frontal images and forgiving lighting with few occlusions of the face, um, which allow the AI to make progress on the task at hand in the beginning. And then we want also hard ground truth, which will stretch the model by giving it harder and harder images to work on. So now that we finally have a way of producing all of the data we could ever want, uh, we can start training machine learning models to do interesting tasks. For the purpose of the models here, we created a 100,000 image data set of renders at 512 by 512 resolution uh, with accompanying targets. So you can see here some examples of the image diversity and of the label data. Um, and uh, this data set is publicly available for use in academic research. If you want to try it out yourself, uh, you can go to the URL listed here. The first task I want to look at is a landmark detection. So in this case, we're looking at the fairly standard set of 68 landmarks outlining the chin, mouth, nose, eyebrows, and eyes. Uh, we started with this task as it's one for which data and reasonably accurate labels currently exist and where there are several state-of-the-art systems to compare against. As such, it kind of provided a sanity check for us. You know, is this a thing that makes sense? Is this a thing that's going to work? Uh, so um, this system is trained on synthetic data only, uh, so no real data has been seen at all during training, and yet it's able to do rather well, as, as you can see here. However, when we were evaluating our performance, we ran into an intriguing problem. Our system projects the 3D points from the mesh into the image plane. This results in situations like you can see in the top row, where the occluded jawline correctly projects through the face. However, the convention in datasets like this labeled by humans is to annotate image space landmarks instead, uh, which is a subtly different problem. You can kind of see examples of this on the bottom row. So in order to avoid comparing apples to oranges, we needed to find a way to take our predictions and adapt them to this slightly different problem domain. So interestingly, the solution was to train a second network to kind of adjust the landmarks. It was presented with pairs of the landmarks coming from our system, which we're using this kind of 3D projection uh, convention and then human annotated landmarks for a subset of the images from the training set and the validation set um, for this data set. And what it learned was how to take our landmarks and kind of move them around in the image plane so that they looked as though they'd been labeled by humans, which then allowed us to fairly compare our system uh, to the data um, in the data set. So what we see is that our system, despite never seeing the real images and only seeing the real landmarks in order to learn this transformation that I just mentioned, outperform systems trained on the annotated real images. So having just seen synthetic data, it's able to do better on this task uh, when evaluated using the normalized mean error by intraocular distance. Um, and what's interesting is that the architecture that we used, which was a ResNet 50, which is a fairly standard architecture with a lot of capacity, it just works better when given more data, which makes sense. And so this is a situation where just increasing the amount of data results in better overall results, even in very extreme occlusions like you can see here. One interesting thing about this approach is that we can tailor data set size based upon performance metrics. In this case, there are diminishing returns after 50,000 images, but if the metric on the validation data keeps going down, there's no reason we couldn't keep producing new examples until diminishing returns are encountered. It should be mentioned, however, that this data does come at a cost. For example, the full data set of 100,000 images I mentioned a moment ago took 48 hours to render using 150 NVIDIA M60 GPUs for a cost of 7,000 US dollars and emitting about as much CO2 as a passenger flight from London to San Francisco. Those who've gathered data sets in the space know that this is comparatively good value for money, but at the same time, it is always good to keep in mind the real costs of machine learning. However, uh, why stop at 68 landmarks? Uh, the main reason for existing landmark annotation convention is that there is a limit to what human beings can label consistently and accurately at scale. 
There is no such limit, however, to the annotations we can produce, which creates some very interesting possibilities. One of them is increasing the number of landmarks by an order of magnitude. Here you can see these dense landmarks, which give a level of detail and face movement on par with marker-based systems while requiring no special makeup or preparation. Another interesting task in this category is face parsing. In this task, we want to assign each pixel of the image a semantic label, indicating the part of the face those pixels belong to. Label data of this kind can be produced by humans from real images, but the process is tedious, time-consuming, and very error-prone. In contrast, our system, trained entirely from synthetic data, is capable of producing pixel-perfect semantic labels, even down to individual strands of hair. While these results are incredibly exciting, I want to end on this slide because it highlights something which in AI models is perhaps the most important consideration. In this age in which AI systems play an increasingly vital role in our society, it's more important than ever before that fairness be at the forefront of our considerations. Our work in this area is never done, of course, but from the beginning, we have measured the ability of synthetically trained AIs to generalize to data sets which exhibit high levels of diversity across age, skin tone, and clothing, uh, such as the MUCT database shown here. In many ways, this is our most impactful outcome, and we hope others will explore how the use of synthetic data can create AI systems that are not only accurate, but fair. Thank you. If you want to learn more about this research or to work with the data that I've described, please visit the URL shown here. We look forward to answering your questions at the live Q&A session. So hi everyone, thank you all for coming today. Um, so my, my name is Ivan Aguilar, I'm the chair for the AI and VFX track, and I'll be moderating the session. Um, so today we're gonna have um, the Q&A for the talk called Fake It Till You Make It, Face Analysis in the Wilds Using Synthetic Data Alone. So this talk, uh, so the presentation addressed the generation and use of, of synthetic images of human faces to train machine learning systems for face-oriented tasks, showing that synthetic data can both match real data use and open up new applicate approaches where manual labeling will not be possible. So this is important because um, when using uh, AI to, to do any, any task, you need to have a really large database and it's really time consuming and costly to generate that database and to do all the labeling for it before you even start to do any task with it. Um, so this talk was given by Matthew Johnson, and the Q&A will be given by Virginia Estes. Um, so Matthew is a principal scientist working on computer vision and augmented reality at Microsoft Research Lab in Cambridge, UK. And Virginia is a scientist at Microsoft Mixed Reality Lab and researches in the domain of machine learning and computer vision, also in Cambridge. So before we begin, I'd like to inform you that if you have any questions for the speaker, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom, um, and the chat can be used as well. Um, so I'll start, start things off, Virginia. Um, so to understand the problem of creating um, databases for, for AI training, so what is the typical size of these data sets and what are kind of the steps that normally take place to process data and get it ready for use? Um, in a standard data set or the synthetic one? The, the standard. Well, it depends on which kind of label. So if it's a label that usually is very costly to annotate, you in most cases have very few data data points, maybe a thousand samples. Um, if it's something like, or especially if it's 3D, like a 3D good scan, they're expensive, so you cannot necessarily afford a lot. If it's just labeling cats and dogs, you have ten thousands, obviously. Um, so for faces, a lot of data sets have a thousand images, um, which is good. Uh, in many cases, the main problem with face is that they're not necessarily fairly distributed in, uh, in terms of gender, well, gender is usually fine, like age, uh, ethnicities, or other things like tattoos. And, you know, when you create the product, you want to make sure or a system that it works for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that you mentioned, that was mentioned in the, the video was that, so the data, the process of generating the synthetic data, so it goes from a parametric 3D model, then there is the, the pose, um, the wardrobe is added, and then finally it's rendered. Um, so do you know what, what kind of, what the software is that were used for these process? Oh, so it's like, um, the parametric model is Python. So it's mm -hmm. plain Python, uh, well, PyTorch, you can train it, um, obviously. Um, the, the 
the hair is rendered in Blender. It was created by artists, so different artists use different techniques. Also for the word of, but the actual render is um, with Blender as a software, and um, the render is uh, cycles. And obviously they're far better techniques, but it was good enough. Yeah. That means it's cheaper in terms of compute time, and the advantage of Blender is that it can be scripted. So um, once something works, it's very easy to generate hundreds of thousands of images. Um, and then since this data set is available online, you guys have it on the GitHub. Um, so could users also incorporate their own data into it if they wanted to? And then the train? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, just keep the license and everything and you want to, you know, the licensing issues, but add to it. And if you want to do a pull request <laughs> for anything, we'll be happy. Um, and do, do you know of anybody, has anybody reached out to you guys yet um, about using these tools for and, and software, or if, if you could say? Yes, someone reached out to us to actually use the data uh, for, a, for a commercial product. And the current answer is uh, not. <laughs> but, we, we, you know, it's something we, the, published was, the paper got published recently. Uh, there are a lot of things that need to be figured out. But for research, yes, please use it. And, Oh, somebody's asking, um, what's the link to the, to the data set that they get? Uh, should be in the presentation. Let me, uh, type my, I did send the link here. Sorry. I'm just scrolling down so I can find it. Uh, to send a link. Yeah. That's cool. Great. Um, so another question I have is the, the data that you use. Um, oh, there's a question here. So in terms of, of using face analysis, how do you see this tool and data set being used to improve facial tracking um, for FBI, for CIA, military, and other similar companies? Uh, could you repeat for which application? Um, so, so for face analysis. Um, so, how do you see this being used for maybe for for uh, for maybe for for, uh, for people that like for the FBI for, for surveillance for military? Well, uh, I don't know exactly what applications they target. Hopefully, they would have. It. Obviously, we don't have labels of suspicious. Like the only labels they have is like things that are geometry or expression, smiling, frowning. What we believe is that in terms of, for instance, landmark tracking or segmentation, the fact that we can't control exactly the diversity and it's a key for distribution would mean that hopefully, uh, you know, for instance, landmark detectors tend to fail with people with darker skin around the mouth. Well, hopefully we avoid these errors. And now military, I, I cannot answer that question. <laughs> Um, so in the data that you showed, do you also take, uh, um, so it's, uh, you generate the synthetic data and you've seen it from different lighting points, right? Some different facial expressions. Um, have you also thought of doing for the different um, conditions for the weather? So if it's rainy, for example, right? Then you have rain and it would bounce off light or the, the hair would change because it would be damp or windy conditions. Yeah, we, we didn't do that. So the only thing we do in terms of environment, we have HDR, so we have, which, you know, have both become both a background and lighting conditions, but we don't have wet hair we, per se. Uh, there's no wind for the moment. Um, so th in terms of animation, if you were to do like that, the hair will not necessarily, maybe in a couple of sequences which are handcrafted, but we're not fully simulated. It's not a, it's not a full simulation of all the possible effects of rain dog droplets or like that. So in terms of, I guess, uh, the rendering, it could be improved when we do it. Uh, is, is it good enough compared to what we have? And that's yeah. where we went for something simple. So um, do you know if, if, if it would work? So if, if I were to have it, right, so on a phone, I was running it to try to detect my face and try to, um, expressions on it. But if it, if, if the, if there, if it was raining, for example, um, would it still be able to detect somebody's face? I think so. It, it you know. Uh, be out of sample, but uh, mm -hmm. I've played with this little webcam demo that we have, and I was putting a hat and occlusions, and you know, it, 
it was not just perfect, but it reasonably works. Okay, great. Um, so one thing I, one, I'm also curious is, so the models that you use, right? So they're not um, very realistic characters. You can notice that they're, that they're models. Um, does that impact in any way, right? If you were to use more realistic characters, would that improve the data? Or do you think it's good enough for what it's being used? I'm sure you could improve it. I guess the question is at what cost? If to get 2% yeah. better, if you have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars for that, maybe you don't want to go that way. Um, a lot of the images for deep learning are usually pre-processed. So it's not like you're trying to, it's not a gun where you need trying to discriminate if it's real or not. We are just trying to, what are the features that landmark detectors use? I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not sure they actually use realism as something they, they use to detect if something is a face or an eye. Okay. And obviously it could be improved, but it would come at a cost. So processing this data set cost took around, took around 120 hours. Um, so another question is, um, so the, the, what you guys are normally focused on for this one is the, the, the creating data that's for face data sets. Um, are there any plans for also to expand this for other things? So creating for the body, um, so for, yeah. for... Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, the main issue, uh, there are many issues there. Uh, clothing is, you need to start considering skirts, flowing garments, and... Uh, but yes, something we're working on. Okay. And then I think Matthew showed a little bit that the, you, you guys have also worked on synthetic data for hands, right? So for the HoloLens to track uh, the hands. Actually, yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually the, the pre-project to this one was actually hands model. And um, it was mostly joints, so I didn't have expressions, obviously, and or identity. Mm -hmm. um, okay, it had some compliments, watch the two, some sleeves. And that's actually how big parts of HoloLens were strained. And it was actually very nice because at some point of closer to actually shipping, they, they realized it failed with certain kind of on uh, of sleeves. And so it was possible to add them synthetically and train it within a few days, which you couldn't go and acquire the data at that speed. And is that is is that what, what's being used right now with HoloLens? Um so whenever the user uses their hands to track or to press buttons? It's been, part of it has been trained in synthetic data, yes. Okay. Um, so another question is, um, are there steps taken to continuously improve the, the processing efficiency of facial data and reduce cost of its creation? Uh, we do keep improving. The main issue is we have different bottlenecks, different parts of the project, and obviously we focus on the bottleneck. If we know something can be improved, so for instance, we realize different, different, uh, the current data set doesn't have a large diversity of necklines, obviously, because if you get the lower neckline, well, you need to start modeling the chest, but that's something that we're currently adding, and dual ray or things like that, uh, which, you know, means the illumination will change uh, face tattoos. So there are other things in the pipeline, but that was the first chunk where we realized it was working well already. Um, so I guess the next question is, uh, do you see the software being integrated into future Windows updates or alt space or other w Windows applications? Uh, I guess the software per se, I, I'm not sure, I don't think we will. Models or software trained with this data, yes. I'm sure we will integrate And how, how is the R&D um, aspect at Microsoft for, for AI? Um, so in terms uh, of... So yeah, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, so go ahead and answer it anyway. So um, there are different methods. It could be Microsoft Research, uh, mm -hmm. which is a research lab where people publish. It's applied science. They need to solve a real problem that the company or someone that we care about has. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a part of Mixed Reality, which is part of HoloLens. Okay. As, as a one product, HoloLens or Allspace. And so officially, we're not researchers, we're scientists. The idea being that uh, we do research, but we really our focus is improving the product. And to improve it, we try to do research and publish, share results where we can. But the main goal is to actually improve uh, HoloLens, mixed reality, or human understanding in many cases. Okay. 
Uh, it's a little bit hard sometimes to, to be able to know the two different areas. Yeah, and it's a spectrum. So I have colleagues who are more into shipping and others who are more like into research. And obviously you move depending on where you are. If you're closer to shipping for a long time, you might want to go back to research. Mm -hmm. And it's a continuous path, I would say. Yeah. Um, so what are still some of the open questions that you, in this field right now? You have the synthetic data that you can... Um, you have all the labeling then. So Matthew showed that normally, normally databases, right? There aren't that many labels, uh, but with this, you can create many more because you have, you have full control of everything, the whole model. Um, so wh what is this, where do you now see the next limitation, the next problems? Next problems. Uh, so I think that we could improve here, uh, classes. Um, there is a, so we built the data set and the model, and obviously we acquired some data, and the data we acquired was as diverse as we could find. Um, mm -hmm. But there are some holes, like we don't have a very, old, a lot of elderly people or very young people, yeah, and no one under 18 so far on this data mm -hmm. set for obvious reasons. And obviously that, that impacts the performance we have. So we need to find ways to either, even with the data we have, uh, try to cover that or try to acquire the data. So that's one of, I think that's, that has an impact. Uh, as you said, modeling things like that, well, if your background is rain, do we have wet here? And all these finer details that maybe for landmark detection are not that important, but for other applications, I think will uh, be important. And that I think it's more on a case by case and it depends on what problem we're trying to solve and we analyze so that's what we, those are the five, ten, hundred thousand problems that we are solving as Microsoft, which are the bottlenecks, and and that's the ones we tackle first. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so I guess kind of going back. So you, as you mentioned, right, the, for the Hololens project, you guys are using the tracking of the hands. Uh, were you also involved with that project? No, uh, I joined. A, I was in the. I joined with the Faces team. Okay, I was going to ask if you knew um, what, what what kind of changed from one to the other. Like, what what if there was a lot of knowledge that um, from was hands to faces? Yeah, um, it was quite different. So the hand model was quite simple. It was joined. So it had no identity. The data we used to train was completely quite different. Um, so if you want, it was like the warm up where a lot of people got interested. It proved we could do something, and then. Like once you tackle faces, you start realizing actually wrinkling, and that's important. And obviously, if you don't wrinkle in your hands, the hand will still be correctly detected. Like, um, people, we use faces to talk, and that's where we look. And so it's important that we reflect people's at the identity and appearance. And that's much more complex. People are obviously more um, sensitive to their misrepresentation of the face and their misrepresentation of the hands. And um, a question is for, for those that are wanting to get into the space, I know um, that, so I, I, I'm, I'm assuming most people there at Microsoft have probably um, studied for many years, but for those that are trying to get into the field, right? They never, they haven't done anything with machine learning yet. They want to get into AI. Um, where would you suggest people start? Uh, say it obviously depends on your background and where you would like to go. Uh, I think it's usually easier to, do, to dive into something where there's some connection between what you've done and just ask people that you think you would like to do what they are doing and say, okay, how, how do I get there? And most people are happy to help you or figure out the connection. And so Microsoft has a residency program, for instance. So we had someone joining Sebastian from the paper, uh, uh, actually joined the residency program, did very well, and then joined the team. Uh, most of us have done a PhD, but others not. And so just based on ability and just be open to people saying what you want, where you want to get, and they will help you, or at least give you their advice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and where do you see the future of using um, AI? Actually, what, when, close to me, stopping back. So when you guys use, when you guys started using this, um, creating this data set, where do you see the possible uses of it? We've done discovering, for instance, uh, one of the, the uses is that we realized we could get very dense landmarks. There are 700 landmarks. 
And actually, that's very good. So you can fit a model or it's in many cases enough to recognize identity instead of like fitting a full 3D, uh, a full 3D model. So I think uh, it just, we're still discovering them. So I think having ex extremely highly accurate data on 3D, uh, label data on 3D opens the door to different applications. You can also, 3D data is very expensive. So if you can generate it synthetically, that lowers the entrance to using more complex models and getting better results. Mm -hmm. Another question is, um, is more research done to create models for wrinkles in minor muscle twitch deformation? Um, we have some models. I don't know the details and I'm not sure exactly how much detail I could give, but yes, we are improving on that. So for instance, um, when you're dealing with eye tracking cameras, you, you want get information about the eye wrinkles. Um, or like looking at the mouth, if, if you smile, there are wrinkles, and so that's informative. Um, it might not be based on images, so there are other kind of sensors you might want to use. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are some models. I don't know the details fully. Um, and I guess now to, to wrap up. Um, so where do you see uh, the use of machine learning in the next couple of years? Uh, I think we, machine learning since 2012 or 15 has actually been growing their applications. So things that up until now thought were not possible, now we're starting to get good results. So neural rendering, things like that. that um, if you want, we just got the hammer and now we're trying it on everywhere. And we discovered that some problems are solvable with machine learning, others are not, but hopefully they can be improved uh, and we can get there. So it's, let's say it's a, it's a very noisy area at this point. We're trying so many things and some will work great, others not. I think um, it's great that we're exploring, using, can we train a model using that data and good, good, good results. With these papers is the answer like yes for some task. And I think um, like that we'll get other surprises as we improve. Okay, um, so I guess, now to wrap up, um, I wanted to thank you again for your time for the Q&A um, and for the, also for this great project that you worked on with everybody. Um, oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for watching. Uh, and if you haven't already seen the talk, please go and watch it and watch the other talks that we have as well. I think you'll enjoy them. Um, and would you want to say anything else before we close, Virginia? Um, no, but if anyone finds the work interesting, please send us an email and any question, anything not answering, if you want to know how to get to work on these problems, you know, in some surprise we are hiring, so we'll be ha very happy to hear from any of you. Yeah, okay, thank you. So um, thank you everybody for coming um, and ha have a great rest of your day. Thanks.